Welcome to the Anchored Voice. This is a podcast helping men to anchor life. I'm your host, Dr. Phil Tu. Welcome to the program. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Anchored Voice, a podcast helping men to anchor life. I'm your host, Dr. Phil Too. I'm excited about my guest I have right here in the virtual studio. Uh, Before we go to my man, let me let you know that this podcast does have a sponsor. This podcast is sponsored by Kimon Hines, Ideas to Life. Check him out June 17, 730. Three steps to turning your ideas into income. Three steps to turning your ideas into income. Check him out, Ideas to Life. Kimon Hines, Ideas to Life. We're also sponsored by McGuire Wear, Fashion Your Faith. Go to McGuireENT.com backslash McGuire Wear and Fashion Your Faith. Thank you, everybody. Listen, we'd love for you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, McGuire ENTV. McGuire ENTV. We'd love for you to subscribe to our channel. If you would like to be a sponsor, write us at info at McGuireENT.com. McGuireENT.com. And check us out. We'd love to have you as a sponsor for one of our podcasts. My man, Brad Butler. What's up, bro? How you doing, man? None much, man. I'm good. I'm good. Can't complain. How are you? I'm great, man. Let me tell y'all, this is Brad is one of the best motivational speakers out there in the country. I know you hear about a lot of people, but Brad is well accomplished um, out of New Jersey. Yes, sir. Out of New Jersey. So we're neighbors. I'm from New York, New Jersey. It's, it's all good. So we we just want to add value to you today, men, uh, those who are watching. We love to add value to you, you know, because we're dealing with uh, a situation where adversity comes. And that's why we're called the anchored voice, because how can you stay anchored through adversity? The reason why I call this podcast the anchored voice is that adversity does come in form of storms in form of inclement weather in form of things that shake your boat. And how do you stay anchored through the storm? How do you stay anchored and level and stable for everybody around you, especially if you have a family, if you have friends that depend on you? How can you overcome adversity? And it does come. It's something that's natural. It's something that we have dealt with since childhood. On the playground, we dealt with adversity. (laughs) We dealt with, uh, if if you play basketball, you dealt with adversity, right? You, 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 whether you got chosen on the five, on the next, or you had to be the one to say, I got next, so you can make sure you got in the game. But whatever it was, you had to figure out how to overcome adversity. So uh, first, before we go into this subject, tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do and um, how you add value in your motivational speaking. Sure, no problem. So uh, my name is Brad Butler II, and what I do is I I help educators and coaches increase the graduation rate for students and athletes by incorporating components of SEL. Uh, research-based strategies and my own real life experiences. So I do that through workshops, keynote presentations, uh, consultations, and you know, coaching sessions, mentor sessions, whatever it's going to take to help the educators and to help the uh, students get to where they need to be. That's what's up. That's what's up. And um, it just give me one point. Let's start with one point. How can men overcome adversity? What is the the first thing you want to say to that? Oh, stop competing. Start collaborating. Easy. That's what's up. Yeah. In fact, that's what we're doing right now. Absolutely. Right. This is a collaboration. <laughs> this is a collaboration. I, In fact, McGuire Entertainment Group was built for collaboration. We weren't built to compete with anybody else. We were built to promote people. We were built to promote artists. We were built to promote 
authors and and influencers. That's what McGuire ENT is all about. You know, it's not just about entertainment, but it's it's about influencing the world. And how do you do that? You do that by building other people up, you know. And so, men, you know, uh, one of the ways you can add value to your life is learn how to build up another man. Is how to uh, build up another female, you know, how to build up another woman, you know, building up each other really helps. And, and when you collaborate, especially if you get married, you have to learn collaboration real fast. <laughs> you, you learn that collaboration real fast. So collaborate with somebody that maybe knows a little bit more than you. Maybe. Oh, yeah somebody who has the same gifting or, or something different that can add to what you're doing. So you're like, you know what, this would be a good fit. You know, this would be a good fit for what I'm trying to do. And so you look around at, you know, the people around you and eventually you find, Hey, you know what? I can collaborate with these uh, companies or this individual. And uh, you know, and, and in that my business now starts to go up. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I try to make it my business to go into rooms where I'm not the smartest one there. Wow. Or I, or I have the least amount of experience because yeah. I, I want to make sure that I'm ever evolving, that I'm constantly learning. So I'm always downloading ebooks on my phone, um, reading something, studying something, sharing information with my wife. Um, and then, of course, you know, I'm trying to be around people that are like minded, that are on the same level as me, in a sense. Um and then from there, of course, uh, I have my speakers group that I have. So I'm, I'm teaching. So I'm coaching my mentees to help them get to the next level, to help them get started in the speaking industry. So you have to have those three tiers in your life at all times. And you should always kind of be in that middle area where you have people that are around you who are like minded and are somewhat on the same level as you. And it just keeps you grounded. And you always have someone to kind of reach up to to try to get information from and someone to pour down to so you can give information to others. That's what's up. Yeah. Collaboration. That's that's one way. Adversity is going to come. But, you know, the other thing about collaboration when it comes to adversity is it's that you learn how other people have dealt with conflicts and you see how they solve problems and then you learn also how to solve a problem. And so the greatest thing I learned, it was under me being a leader, but under leadership. And I got to see how they handled board meetings and agendas and, and people coming at them with all kind of accusations. And <laughs> I was able to learn from my father, seeing him in a leadership role. I was able to learn from other leaders that I had and, you know, people would just stand up and they'd come with the craziest notions about the leader and straight to the leader, right up in their face, say whatever they felt like saying. But then your response is critical to what's coming at you. And so another way to overcome adversity is be prepared for adversity. Right. Be prepared for it. a lot of times we have a mindset that, you know, when we say Man, if they do that thing one more time, <laughs> I'm a we've already mentally checked out or we've checked into choosing violence. <laughs> you know, we, we've already started, decided how we're going to handle that conflict. Yeah. If they say that thing to me one more time, this is this is what I'm going to do. Oh, yeah. I mean, it depends on your upbringing as well. Your personality traits. Um, so, um I mean, it's just a matter of having that um, EQ, right? We mm -hmm. all know of IQ, you know, your intellectual ability, but uh, EQ is very important as far as your emotional awareness, understanding what you're feeling and why you're feeling it at the time. And that's super important, especially for our men, because, you know, when we were younger, you know, you get told, hey, you know, you know, men don't cry or, you know, you know, stop acting like a punk or this, this and that, whatever it might have been. So you harbor those feelings and you think that it's not okay for you to cry. It's not okay for you to say that you're sad or you don't feel good about this, or, you know, you, you don't feel like you can confine in somebody. So when they become adults, you know, grown men, and they experience these feelings in a certain situation, it, nine times out of 10, it's going to explode and it's going to turn into physical violence or aggression, whatever it might be. 
And that's what gets people in trouble because before the incident happened, or so we all know that <laughs> anger is a is is not the uh the main problem, okay? Anger yeah. is the, the secondary thing, right? Yeah. So you're angry about X, Y, and Z because of something. Somebody said something to you that hurt your feelings or made you feel uh, worthless or, you know, you're, you're not able to do X, Y, whatever it might be for that person. It's always an underlying thing. So if somebody, if people can learn to get their EQ together, as far as understanding their emotional intelligence, why they're feeling the way that they feel, you know, why they're dealing with the, the feeling that they have, then they'll be able to address it because it's about awareness. So that's a part of my, you know, my ABCs to success. And the first one is A, which is awareness. The second one is C, consistency. And the last one is, I'm sorry, B is, uh, A is for awareness, B is for beginning, C is for consistency. So if the first thing you do is you become aware of what it is that you're feeling, what you're going through at the time, you can then begin to work on it and structure, fix that thing, move, remove yourself from that situation right. or, you know, address whatever it is at the time and then see See, is be consistent with what you're doing as far as the healing process. You know, right? it's not it's not good enough to just deal it one time and then walk away from it, and then you go back to your old ways. You have to remain consistent with the way you work on a thing so that you can get yourself out of that situation. So I use the ABCs for success as far as anything that you know I'm trying to do to overcome a certain thing, especially adversity. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, once you're aware of things, you're able to address that. You're able to speak to that. And um, consistency is always key. Consistency. And, you know, it's an amazing thing when you deal with conflict, but somebody looks at you later and says, man, you're always consistent. You know, no matter what's coming your way, you are always consist consistent. And that's because we're aware. <laughs> we, are, we are aware of what we could say. We are aware of how we can react, you know, how e even if we were raised certain way, even if it's been in our DNA, once we're aware of that, then we can speak to it. But a lot of people act that like they're not aware, but they are. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people excuse it and say, well, you know, that's just me. That's just me. That's just how I do. Well, yeah, that's how you did. <laughs> but what results are you getting every time? Right. And so you keep doing it the same way. You keep responding the same way. But somehow you get the same results and it never goes in your favor. You keep saying, well, this is me, but you are still angry. You are still bothered. You are still bitter. And the, the situation never has been resolved. Oh, yeah. And um, one of the things that I've realized, you know, just. Over this short span of life that I've had so far is that, you know, with all the forms of adversity that you're going to face and all the ups and downs that you're dealing with, no one cares. No one really cares. Um, so there's no point in complaining about it and going back and forth about, you know, he did this, she did that. They said this, they said that. Well, if they would have done. OK, I, I get it. But complaining is not going to help you get any closer to solving the problem. So um, someone told me a long time ago, you know, uh, it is like a rule of thumb that goes along with complaining. It's like 80% of the people of the world don't care. And the last 20% are glad it's you and not them. So there's no <laughs> point in complaining. That's right. There's no point in complaining right. in the first place. So I had to learn that in order for me to get past the thing that I'm dealing with, as far as the form of adversity, I have to face it. Like, especially as men, like we so quick to punch somebody in the face. Like to you know to shoot a gun, get in a fight, you know, jump somebody, whatever. But you like you like you will be the last ones to say I got I have trauma, like I got childhood trauma. Somebody somebody said something to me when I was younger. Somebody did something to me when I was younger, right. and it's right. affected me up into my adulthood. And which is yeah. why I can't have a conversation with my wife the right the right way. I can't show love to my son or my daughter the right way. Like I'm telling you, like that is the main thing that people are dealing with, especially black men. Yeah, it, it's so much trauma that's out there that they have they they know is there. They know they need to address it, but they refuse to address it because they feel like it's going to make them feel like they're weak if they go see a counselor or if they go talk to somebody about it or they try to confide in or they might have tried to and that somebody laughed at them. Right. Somebody used it against them. I've been there. Well, I express like I expressed something that was deep for me, like, yo, man, like this is this and that. 
and they use it against me later on and you shut down You're like, well, I'm never doing that again, but I get it. The only way that that thing will actually have control over you is if you allow it to, yeah. which means that you have to then grab hold of that thing. You have to gain control over that situation so that you are now in control over how, you know, the results come out. Because if you allow it to just fester and simmer and just sit in that closet and you're running from it, eventually it's going to catch up to you. And nine times out of 10, what ends up happening is that thing will rear its ugly head at the worst time possible. That's right. Right. So I always say whatever it is that you're dealing with, have that uncomfortable conversation with the person that you don't want to have it with and do it like, come on, like invest in yourself one time, like just, you know, cry once and get it out the way. You know, it's interesting. A lot of people don't want to have that uncomfortable conversation. And it'd be about something very simple. Like, oh, man, every time they come around, they do this. And I'm like, well, why don't you just ask them to do something different so that you're not bothered and they have a clear understanding? You know, so what happens is we have unrealistic expectations about people, about life. All right. Well, if I come into the room, they should act like this or they should respond like this. We even have an unrealistic expectations about when we tell somebody something that's deep. You know, we didn't realize that they're they're not emotional enough, uh, mature enough to handle what we're about to say. And we thought they were, but they aren't. And some people, be honest, some people have not grown past 14 in their emotional maturity. They, yeah, there's they, a lot of people who haven't grown past where, wherever the trauma hit. Right. Whatever that age was, they stuck right there. Right there. Then they won't do anything about it. And no matter how many people try to tell them, they get defensive, they deflect, and they don't want to deal with the real issue. You know, it's interesting when I speak on a subject that hits somebody to their core, they don't want to address that issue. They want to deflect and bring up another issue. Well, if you want to address that issue, why don't you address this issue? Well, we can address all kinds of issues, but we're, we're dealing on this topic right now and we're sticking here. So a lot of people, what they do is deflect in order not to address. And so, you know, they end up not give, getting the right effect or getting the right attention to the problem because they're constantly deflecting. You know, we call that in psychology, you know, uh, projecting, <laughs> projecting. And here's the reality. Hurt people hurt people. Oh, yeah, that's a fact. That's hurt a fact. people. Yeah. Hurt it, people, hurt people. And, and that's why you see so many um, failed relationships. And I'm not just talking about like intimate relationships. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about mm -hmm. businesses, you know, business relationships, friendships, right. you know, um, um, family relationships. That's why you see some so many that are broken. And, and you, like you can pretty much go up to anybody out there and either they've had a failed relationship in some way, shape or form. And it's because some people are just immature, yeah. Like they're immature and they don't want to grow. They don't want to like, because it hurts. It's hard work. The process is hard. It's painful. But yeah. I promise you, like that th is a, a saying that saying that I said earlier is like, have the conversation and cry once. Right. And get it out the way and be yeah. done with it. It, it. I don't know if anybody has ever felt it before or, or been there before, but have you ever had something that's just pent up inside you, you su super mad about it, or it's aggravating, or it's causing anxiety or whatever it might be. And then you finally have the conversation either with the person, or you go to the gym and punch a punching bag or something like that to get it out of your system. Yes. Then, you know, you feel better about your day or going about, you know, the rest of your day because you were able to get it out of your system. But if you let that thing just sit there, then it's going to bother you it's, and, and it'll go from a day to a week to a month to a year to decades holding on to something that you should have let go a long time ago. And then nine times out of 10, you have your side of the story, but you don't have the other person's side of the story. So then when you finally get their side of the story, then you're like, oh, wow. Okay, well that 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 actually makes sense. Okay, I, I I didn't know that you did that, or I didn't know that was the reason as to why, or I didn't know that was going on with you. Like everybody has their own story. Like I have mine. I'm sure you have yours. Where like I had that breaking point where I needed to go have that uncomfortable conversation with the person I needed to have it with to be able to free myself to be the person that I am today. 
That's real. And, you know, a lot of conflict can be resolved by the question, why did you? Or why did this happen? You know, and when you get to that question, you get the, the answer. And it, it's, let's say the person was being petty. You give that person an opportunity to say, listen, my bad. I was just being petty. <laughs> when you ask the question, hey, why did you say that? Or why did you? Oh, OK. OK. Well, what did you think? Well, you know, it kind of looked like you said and then you're able to resolve it. Now, if it's a real conflict, hey, why did you say that? Well, because and, and then you're a, you're still able to hash it out and you're you know, but a lot of us don't want to have that uncomfortable conversation. We'd just rather blame somebody, uh, point the finger and walk away and think right. it's OK. We'd rather a lot of us would rather be comfortable in bitterness. Mm -hmm. A lot of us are comfortable being angry. Like we jump to anger so quick. So as my man, um, Gamal Alexander said, communication is key. Communication is key. If you know how to communicate this, this is our line of work. Like we don't just communicate by public speaking, but we also have to communicate behind the scenes. And, you know, it's not always perfect, but we perfect our communication. The more we perfect our communication, the better we get at resolving a lot of conflict. Right. Right. I mean, I'm in the business of effective communication. So that's a part of the reason why I got certified in uh, William Marston's disc assessment. So I could understand the four personality traits that are out there. I haven't had an argument with anyone in God knows how long, because as soon as I'm confronted with a certain type of personality trait or style of communicating, I know how to communicate with them. Either I know that this, co this conversation isn't going to go anywhere. So there's no point in me continuing the conversation. Right. Or I know how to adjust to that person's style of speaking so that we can then have a, a a conversation that's not going to be detrimental to the relationship that we could possibly have. So, yeah, it, it, it just makes life easier for me. I'm like, OK, I know what that is. No problem. This is how I handle it. Cool. And we're, we, I'm in. I'm out. I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm high energy, so I know I have to sometimes bring it down a bit. <laughs> so, you know, I'm aware, you know, I'm like, what? For real? And, you know, but knowing those personality traits are, is powerful. Yeah. And, um, you know, being that you're certified in that, that's a powerful step right there. That's yeah, a yeah. powerful step right there. And it's helped you to effectively communicate with people. Um, I, I had recently somebody go back and forth with me on social media. On, you that's know, always fun. On this channel right here, right? And, you know... I pretty much I I will, you know, go back with a calm conversation just to help them out. After a while, I let it go and let them say their last statement. I don't have to have the last statement, you know, and then I delete it. I you, you're not going to find these res residue conversations left on social media. Now, there's a lot of times um, on Facebook. You know, they'll they'll come at me with, well, Pastor, why did you do this? And I will try to explain. Now, I'll tell you, I can't help if you're the odd person out on that conversation trying to make me look bad because I'm not going to make me look bad. I'm going to communicate effectively and calmly to your question. But then the other people that are reading your comments, I can't help that. <laughs> <laughs> right. and, and, and some people have gotten hurt because they go into, you know, they're not willing to accept your answer. They're not willing to accept this is where I stand on this subject. They are more bent on trying to change my approach or change my thought or, or change my mind. I'm like, it's not about you changing my mind. You spoke your truth. I spoke my truth. Can we leave it at that? Or why do you have more attacks to go? So I, I know how to really, you know, get through those attacks because, you know, sometimes the truth is not good enough for people. Yeah, I, I definitely get you. Um, it's just there's people in this world where they have false expectations. 
Like that's the that's the problem. Like I, I'm telling, like I love my wife to death, but there's she she sees the good in people, like nothing but the good in people sometimes. And sometimes I got to tell her, I'm like, nope, that's gonna be a problem. Like you let that, you do this or do that, or like I know you want to help, but it's gonna turn. I'm like, let me explain to you how this could turn into a problem. Yeah, because this one's gonna do this and this and that, and then it's gonna come back on you. And she's like, ooh. Yeah, I don't want that. I'm like, no, you don't. Leave it alone. <laughs> Leave it alone. Like, I have to be the bad guy at times to break it down because that's who I am. Like, I'm a high extrovert. So if you looked at my yeah. scale on the disc assessment, I'm a 9990, I'm a 9995i, bro. I'm a wow. high extrovert, super extrovert. I am yeah. like that at all times. I bring the energy, I bring the juice when I'm on stage, right? right? And that's a part of the reason why people bring me in to speak because of the energy that I exude. If you in a bad mood, you won't be for too much longer. Once I get there, like, yeah. you know, cause that's yeah. the energy that I bring. Yeah. But my wife is an introvert, a high introvert. Mm -hmm. So when I first met my wife and we started talking and we, mm. you know, I was courting her and everything, right. I'd be super excited about something. Maybe it's a speaking engagement or something like yeah. that. Like, oh man, this is going on. Blah, blah, blah. And I was on stage and this is that what happened. And it was like, boom, 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 boom. And this is that. And she's like, Whoa, why are you yelling? I thought, like, what you mean? I'm <laughs> I'm excited. What you mean? This is a good thing. And she was like, we in the house. Like, <laughs> stop yelling because she she like her mind doesn't perceive the, the loud noise as excitement. She perceives it as just loud. Loud. And obnoxious. So I had to learn to turn it down, like, you know, turn it down when I talk to her because you know, she doesn't like she grew up in a household where no one yelled. Like no one raised their voice. That's, that wasn't what they did. Even when they were happy, they didn't raise their voice. Right. So I was like, oh, oh, okay, that's different. Whereas with my family, we ain't, we ain't do nothing but yell and cuss. So, right. <laughs> so that's what they did. Like that's where I come from, from Jersey City. Right. So th they was yelling, they was cussing, they was, you know, doing partying, doing what they right. do. We listen to house music. Right. So all night is a party. Yep. All night is loud. You know, we have a full blown conversations with the speakers right here, bro. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> Listen, I'm going to play this segment for my wife. OK. Oh, yeah. Because she, she she gets after me. I wake up on level 20. You know, I get up in the morning and I'm already up here and she's she's like, nah, I got to kind of like coast into the day. Like right. you, you just coming with it, especially if I see my son in the morning. Oh, man, it's over. And I'm throwing him up in the air and 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 we getting all kind of loud, um, you know, whether it be the TV on like she's like, you sure you can hear that? I'm like, yeah, it's it's perfectly at the right pitch. And and of course, you know, uh, back in the day, you know, we blasted music in our cars. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but I put my dad's old speaker in one of our cars and I learned how to splice that baby into the car, <laughs> into the system. I'm talking about a house speaker in the back of the car. Just so right. I can just bump it down the road, <laughs> you know, so I, you know, loud has always been, you know, even listen, you know, when I call certain family members, I know I have to turn down the phone because that's just the way we are. We're excited. We're, mm -hmm. we're a little bit loud. My man said, God bless you guys. I need to wake up before I get loud. Oh, no, yeah. you ain't got to put a blessing on me. I'm not a morning person. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not a morning yeah. person, but you know, it's just, I get up and I do what I do or whatever. Like, it, all right, here's the thing I've learned over time to not treat my energy like an on and off switch. Mm -hmm. So I learned to treat it like a dimmer. Yeah. So I gradually turn it up to 10. So, right. and it depends on where I'm at and what I'm doing. If yeah. I'm on stage, I gradually, I turn that thing all the way up to 10, sure. right? If I'm having a conversation with my wife, I don't need to ha have it all the way at 10. It might yeah. just need to be at five. Right. right? And that's perfectly fine. Yeah. But I need to have control and I have to have the awareness that's of right. where I'm at, who I'm talking to, what's the demographic, what is what is deemed appropriate in this atmosphere. If I go to a urban school, a title one school, I'm going to turn it up to 10. There probably isn't even going to be a time in the beginning where I kind of introduce myself. I'm going right into it with these right kids in. because I have no time to play with them. They in gangs, they doing all types of crazy that's stuff. Right. So I got to get to it. But if I go to a PWI, oh, I gradually turn that thing up give them a little bit of, you know, that top end energy and I can turn it back down because they don't need that. They're not even used to that same type of energy. That's right. So, you know, it's just understanding yourself. That's that EQ. What do you want to tell a young man 
about dealing with adversity. Of, of course, we said stop competing, do more collaborating. Um, what else do you want to tell a young man that if he's watching this or listening, uh, how can he also overcome adversity? And we're talking about whether it be the law against them, whether he feels like it's teachers against him, the world is against him. How, how can we really help that young man out? Uh, what he needs to understand is that there's always going to be a form of adversity that's there. And I, it, it might not come in the form that you think it's going to come in. And OK, right now you might be young and think that your only form of adversity is that you have a lack, uh, a lack of uh, capital, a lack of money. Right. But then if you get money, then there'll be another form of adversity because you might be having to deal with uh, separating yourself from people who are just trying to uh, just just take from you. Right. They don't mm. they're not bringing anything to the table. They just want to yeah. take from what you have. So there's always going to be a different level of adversity that happens to you. And you just need to understand that there's always a storm. Right. Yeah. Either you're heading into a storm, That's you're right. in the middle of a storm or you're coming out of a storm. Yep. But there's always a storm. Always. Now, the sooner you get comfortable with being uncomfortable, it, the better things will work out. <laughs> for you. I had a, my coach, Dan Garrett from uh, from Kane University. He used to always yeah. tell me. Uh, he's like, Brad, you know, we, you got to run these laps or you got to do these sprints or you got to do this or that. You got to go to the weight room and this and that. And I believe it was somebody that said it. I didn't say it. Somebody was like, man, this is crazy, man, doing this now. I don't want to do or whatever. And he was like, you guys better get real comfortable with being uncomfortable. Wow. You better learn how to suffer in silence because I don't want to hear it. And nobody else does either because they're wow. going through the same exact thing that you're going through. So the thing that I heard in my mind was, we're all already here doing it. There's no point in complaining because you signed up for the team to get better. So why would you complain about the thing that he's giving us to make us better? That's right. Come on. So just do it. That's like, so right. just do what you got to yeah. do. Get through it. You yeah. ain't going to die. Come on. That, that's the thing I always tell my wife. She was like, oh, you, you don't need no ketchup or you don't need this or that or you don't need another pillow or another blanket. I'm like, I ain't going to die. I'm good. I'm like, I used to sleep in the backseat of my car in the middle of the night, you know, wow. under the stars because I couldn't get, I didn't have the money to get back home and go to school. Like I was working two full-time mm. jobs while I was in school and everything. So it was rough. So there's a lot of things about my story and my past that people don't know. So there's things that I'm perfectly fine with. Like my wife, I've never told my wife to cook nothing for me. She's never had to cook a meal for me. She does it out of the kindness of her heart. And I thank her for that. But uh -huh, uh -huh. I don't ask her to do nothing. I'm not one of them types to be like, okay, uh, can you make this tonight? Can you do this or uh, make this or do that or whatever? I don't care. The fact that she took the ring and said, I do, that's enough. Because mm. she made the commitment that, okay, I will, I will spend the rest of my life with you. And I'm committed to the journey. And I believe in your dreams. I'm cool with that. So we ain't mm. got to do none of the extra stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. So- but yeah. I, and, and I appreciate that, but I, I will be asking my wife for some ackee and sawfish. That's all I'm saying. You know, hey, hey, listen, she throws down on that. Yeah. <laughs> hey, listen, ain't, ain't nothing wrong with having a favorite dish or a favorite meal. You yeah, know, yeah, no, I get you, man. That. I get you. Listen, when it's my night, I'm like, babe, what you want out? You know what I mean? There you if, go. There you if go. I ain't cooking, it's like, hey, what, what do you want to eat? Let's, let's go. Um, and, and that's powerful. I think your testimony is powerful, man. Uh, a lot of people just don't know what we had to do to experience life. And sometimes, Ooh, listen. you know, you have to sleep in that car. You have to learn how to sleep in the car. And and, and they're just they're just things you're, you don't necessarily you know, glorify it, but it is what you had to do to get to where you need to be. I would dare to say everyone needs adversity. Oh, yeah. Everyone oh, yeah. needs it. It's not about, you know, because we're always talking about it's not fair. Why not? And I try to tell my kids, I'm like, yo, you need some of this adversity. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, my man Gamal works out all the time. Like, I, you know, I, I donate to the gym. He goes to the gym. Okay. okay? That, that's my adversity, getting to the gym, right? Okay. But when you go to the gym, it's adversity all over the place. Oh, because yeah. resistance mm -hmm. is how you build your body. Yeah. Putting your body through pain and agony, especially if you get a trainer. God forbid you get a trainer. You will you will really understand death while living. Okay. <laughs> you <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm a little different because I played sports all my life. 
Yeah. So like from Pop Warner all the way up to yeah. college and semi pro and then Team America and all that stuff. I played so much football and I put myself through so much pain physically. Right. Yes. I like I've played in games where I have I had nerve damage for in my um my left my left shoulder for three or four months. Wow. Like my wife didn't even know. I didn't even tell her. She was at the game that I got hurt in, but wow. I actually hit somebody with my right shoulder and the shock wave went through. And came out, I guess, through my left shoulder, and my my arm was dead. I was dangling, like I could not lift it up. Mm. And I was in the game, and I was, and like, you know, they pulled me out and all that stuff. And then I snuck back on the field, went back in, and I'm out there with one arm dangling, playing defense. And I'm sure the other team saw it, so they tried to throw the ball at me, and I one handed caught an interception. And then wow. you know that was you know pretty much the end of the game for them, but. You know, it was some, you know, some stuff I had to deal with afterwards. My, like my arm, I couldn't sleep on it properly. It was just like shooting pain through my arm. There's things I put myself through because I'm like, if I can get through, like, I know what the body, you know, can, it has its limitations. Yeah, I know that my body has its limitations, but my mind only has the limitations that I put on it. That's right. So, so for me, if I say I can get through this, if I say that I can make this happen, if I say that I can put myself through it, yeah. I've already spoken into existence. There's life and death in the power of the tongue. So That's right. I only speak onto my life what I want to happen. So yeah. I'm standing on the sideline with my arm hanging down like this. And I'm like, I'm going back in. Mm -hmm. Like, and they're all like, you're not going back in. You're like, we got to check you to make sure you don't have a concussion. Like my wife is over there with the camera. Like, are you okay? I was like, I'm fine. I'm like, don't, I'm good. You know how I get when I'm on the field, I'm locked in. I'm going back in. And the team's like, yo, you can't go back in. We get that you're our starting corner. We get it. And we want you to be like, but the game is pretty much locked up. We got it. We don't need you to go. I said, bro, I'm about to, I'm about to put the nail in the coffin on these fools. I don't care about nothing y'all talking about. I have to get back on this field to prove to myself. I have to break this mental barrier that I have in my mind that's telling me you can't do it without with one arm. You can't you can't lock up a receiver with one arm. I said, all right, watch this. So I went back on the field and did what I had to do. And mind you, I'm the type of corner where I, I didn't get a whole lot of interceptions. I just locked down the side of the field. That was my style of play. Right. But sure enough, the ball would have been in the air. I said, yeah, I got to get that. I got I got to find a way to bring this down. Wow. Wow. But that's where my mind goes. And I, I bring yeah. that same mentality into the business world. I bring yeah. that same mentality into my that's marriage. Right. I bring that same mentality into my family, into my legacy. So people don't understand. I'm sadistic. Like my mind works differently, bro. I'm not normal and I know it. And I'm cool with that. Yeah. Actually, I like it on this side. Yeah. I don't want to be normal because I yeah. see what normal people do and I don't want yeah. no parts of it. Right. Yeah. So yeah. my thing is when I see things that are going wrong within my family, my business, when there was anything that was going wrong within my relationship, yo, I automatically look at it as a challenge. Like, OK, you're yeah. trying to take greatness from me. Come on. Come this, on. This That's adversity, right. this thing, whatever, whether it's on a spiritual realm, yeah. the physical realm, yeah. the mental realm, whatever realm that it is, my dietary, whatever it is, I'm like, yo, you're trying to stop me from getting greatness. You're trying to stop me from being the best version of myself. You're trying to stop me from being the best husband I can be. You're trying to stop me from being the best man I can be, the best business owner, the best speaker, the best spiritual leader I can be. You've lost your mind if you think that I'm going to quit. We're going to have to fight. Like I'm mm. talking about not physically fist the cuss with somebody, but whatever that form of adversity is, me and you, it, it, it's, it's mind over matter. I'm like, we got to fight. Like yeah. you, that, Until you drag me up out of this thing, I'm six feet under the ground. It's a fight on your hands. That's right. Like I think that's why I, some people, they don't, they feel uncomfortable around me sometimes when I start getting into my bag, when it comes to speaking and, and doing my thing and I get locked in on something, bro, it's sadistic. I'm like, yo, I don't need to eat. I don't need to sleep. I don't need no water. I don't need nothing. Move, get out of my way and let me do what I need to do because there's a task at hand and I got to give, I got to make sure I kill it. Because right. I don't know, like when I get on stage and I speak, I don't know if this will be the last opportunity that I have. Like, I don't know if this could be the last podcast that I ever do. So if it is, it'll be on record that I gave it everything that I had, that mm -hmm. I put something on wax that would leave, you know, a legacy for me. So if I, you know, I have family members and, you know, people that are part of my legacy that come down the line be like, yo, yeah, man, it was a guy named Brad who was a part of our family. Yeah, we got some video for him. Yo, that dude was deep. Like that dude had fire for you. Like if he, it was infectious to be around him. Like yeah. that's the type of person that I am. And I'm like that because I literally take everything as a challenge that goes wrong. 
because I believe that I should be able to live in abundance. I believe I should be able to live in bliss. I believe that I should be able to have all these different things that there should, I should be able to break these generational curses. I personally believe that I'm the one that God calls to fix things in my family. It is what it is. Other people can look at it and say, oh, well, isn't that vain or arrogant or whatever? You think what you want to think. But God told me what he told me. And I'm going to do what I got to do. And I don't necessarily know how it's going to pan out or how it's supposed to work. But I do know that nothing will happen. Nothing will change if I don't work and if I don't keep doing the work that I'm doing. That's right. That's right. Wow. That's a powerful word right there. That's a powerful word. And a lot of times people see your success and they're like, oh, I want that success. But you've got to be willing to put in the work. Like if I can tell you my schedule, you know, for what I do randomly through the week, you'd be tired. <laughs> oh. The average person would be like, oh, I'm exhausted. You did all of that in one weekend? Like, yeah, but I have that drive. This is my drive. This is the drive that I do to get what I need to get done. This is the energy that I have to put in. And listen, when I need to take my break, I take it because I've been working. I've been, I've been hustling. I've been putting in the work. And so a lot of people don't understand overcoming adversity means that you have put in the work. You have been prepared for this. People have come with everything they have against you. And that's why you needed that adversity to know how to deal with the future and also uh, to help people in their life how to deal with that and encourage them. And after a while, it, come, it becomes an encouraging force like, nah, man, it's, that's nothing. Listen, we've been through worse. I mean, right. if you grew up in the 80s and the 90s, you've had bad cars. You know, you've had a car that's broken down somewhere. You didn't want it to break down. You know, <laughs> you have had things that have gone. I, I, totally I lived wrong. in the neighborhood. I, okay. I lived in the neighborhood. You didn't want it to break down. in. Right. Right. <laughs> so <it's>, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Listen, you know, it's like, oh, man, my car broke down here. Oh, man. But you learn how to deal with it. So after a while, people are like, man, you made it look so easy because I already I already went through my stress, my anxiety, trying to figure it out. And I figured it out. I don't have to be stressed anymore. It will resolve. It will be resolved. It, we will find a solution to this. We will get through this. So I don't have to worry. I don't have to stress. You know, just like, all right, cool. All right. There, there's times when I know the devil is coming at me so hard. I laugh. I'm like, ha, okay, because everything that can go wrong has gone, gone wrong. wrong. Then I'm like, this this must be an attempt because I'm about to do something great. Right. I'm about to do something phenomenal. I know that every Saturday I get up to preach and get up to speak. There's day I don't feel like doing it, but I know why I'm there. I know why I'm, you know, put to the task. So listen, it's a challenge. It's a challenge for me against me, you know, right. and, and, and so. All right, devil, I, I see what you just threw at me. This is what I got next. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, because we serve a God that gives us all the power, that gives us everything that we need, we tap into that source and we good. Absolutely, man. Like I was telling my wife that before I was like, I, I swear, like ever since I was younger, I always felt like when I had those moments where it felt like everything was going wrong, I was like, something about to happen. Like something, I'm like, but I'm like, something good is gonna happen for me yeah. if I keep going. Right. Like, but if I, but if I deter, you know, from the path, if I deviate from the path, then it'll, it'll just keep going into a downward spiral. Yeah. So I have to find a way to keep doing the thing that I'm doing. Like, you know, I thought about the times when I was sleeping in the backseat of my car. You know, going to school and I'm hungry and I'm just drinking from the water fountain all day at the school. And, you know, I'm tired and I couldn't afford the books or whatever. And I'm just like, yo, but if I stop coming to class, this is all for nothing. You know, if I if I don't go to work, then I, I don't have a chance to make some money to help me get through the next week. That's right. Right. So so I'm like, OK, like if I don't take my dad to, you know, the, the doctor's appointment or my grandmother or my grandfather to their doctor's appointments, if I don't do what I'm supposed to do, if I don't, you know, it, oh, it, it'll be easy for me to go party with everybody else. It'll be easy for me to hang out and play and joke and do, you know, do X, Y, Z. It'll be easy for me to yeah. go sell drugs right now. We, I'm like, I'm cerebral. I'm the one like, listen, I got the game down. My father used to be an urban pharmacist and he was real good at it. So I knew the game. So it was like, man, I could do this. But I was like, nah, the consequences that come with it. I don't really want that. So let me figure out how to make this thing work. You yeah. know, let me just stay on the path that I'm on. 
And it's crazy. At the time, you're doing it with blind faith. You're doing it with blind faith. You're literally just hoping. Like you look at the logo on my hat, like it, it's it's a rep representation of my name, Brad Butler the second, but it legitimately means hope. Mm. It's, mm. Ho it's hope. Mm. Yeah. Like I wear my logo on everything that I that I have because I want people to see hope yeah. in me. Like for me to have been, you know, living in Jersey City, New Jersey, urban community, Martin Luther King Drive. You know it was a terrible street. All right. So I don't know why we do that to Martin Luther King, but <laughs> <laughs> on Martin Luther King Drive, my my mother and my father were both just like big urban pharmacists, bruh, just, just getting it, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, for my father to then go to jail and then for my mother and father to then end up becoming heroin addicts and then have to beat that addiction. And then for me to be, you know, where I'm at as far as, you know, in school and I had to move from the uh the urban community of jersey city to then the suburban community of east windsor then i get thrown into special ed classes for 10 years i'm told i can't go to you know i can't go to college i can't play collegiately i can't do all these things and then i do it anyway mm. you know and i then i went to school and got two degrees and i'm a couple classes away from getting what six classes away from getting my um, my master's right now wow. right and then to become a professional speaker have having been being have mm, having the ability to yeah. Uh, put myself in position where I was offered the opportunity to speak for Fortune 500 companies like Verizon and Mass Mutual. Like that doesn't happen just by happenstance. It happened because things were going wrong the whole time through, and I just stayed focused on the goal at hand. Like mm -hmm. my thing was, I didn't want to see the light at the end of the tunnel. I wanted to be the light at the end of the tunnel. So I was ready to do whatever it took and keep, you, you know, just keep going and grinding until I took the dead end jobs, bro, working the third shift, doing whatever I could do, you know, sleeping on the floors of the uh, office buildings and stuff, watching people come in, you know, with their fancy cars and, and making all this money and just living lavishly. And here I am, you know, doing security work, sleeping on the floor at night. You know, after I do my, my tours and my shifts and stuff like that, just hoping and thinking to myself, one day it's not going to be like this. Like one day I'll be able to do X, Y, and Z for my wife and for my family. I'll be able to do this and do that. One day I'll be a full-time speaker. And then next thing you know, like a year later, I, I'm a full-time speaker. Like it, it works. In, like it, it's People think it's a miracle. It's not. It's preparation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's preparation because people don't even like, okay. Think about it. Oh, we go if we go biblical with it, and I'm not even like a biblical individual where I grew up in church. I'm not. I found God later on, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a late bloomer when it comes to the gospel. <laughs> but there's certain certain stories that I heard and certain things that I picked up the principles. And if you think about David, like the whole David and Goliath situation, yep. he was prepared for the situation That's before right. it happened. Yeah, he was yeah. he was wrestling with with bears and lions. Yeah, he was out in the field doing field work. He was banished. Come like on. he was the like they didn't want him. They could care nothing about him. Yeah, but yeah. he was the savior. He was the one who came along and fixed all the problems that they had. He was the Come one on. who killed the, the who slayed the Goliath. Here's my question for anybody who's listening to this, whether it's now or in the future, whatever it may be, ask yourself this question: What Goliath are you slaying in your life? The things that you're going through right now, the things that, that's preparing you for the Goliath that's coming, are you going to be prepared for it when it gets here? Come on. Mm. Mm. Because before, before Goliath uh, had to deal with David, oh, Goliath killed a whole lot of soldiers. Oh, come on. Mm -hmm. Goliath slayed a whole lot of soldiers. Yep. Right. And the reason why he was able to do that is because the other people, the other soldiers that came his way, they weren't ready to deal with him. They yep. weren't prepared for that opportunity to deal with something like that. And the crazy part about it was the way that they attempt to kill Goliath, the way they attempted to go about it was completely different from the way that David went about it. Because mm. they were warriors, they believed that they were warriors at heart. So I'm coming at you with with the shield and the and the sword in hand, and I'm trying to come cut your head off. Whereas David was prepared to take the Goliath down in a completely different way. Why? Because yeah. he was ordained to do it. Yeah. And it and it had to be done the way that he did it in order for God to get the glory. Yeah. Like had that's the crazy part about it. So when I step on stage and I'm speaking in front of hundreds of kids or I'm speaking in front of hundreds of people at corporate events, it looks like it's a miracle that I'm able to stand there and do it, but it's not. It was preparation. Yeah. It was all, it was the times with, like my first speaking engagement when I had to speak in front of a special ed class with eight kids in it. Come on, come on. For free. That's right. 
It prepared me for when Verizon said, yeah, you can come in and talk to our group. It, pre yeah. it prepared me for when I had the opportunity to speak at the conferences. It prepared me for to be able to work with Jeremy. Like it prepared me for those opportunities. So now when I step in front of it, they look like, oh, it was just so easy for you. You were just born with the gift. You were able to do what? That's why I don't take nothing down on Instagram and Facebook and all that stuff. So you can go back and look at the memories. You can go back yeah. and see my very first video where yeah. I was in a bathroom with my phone propped up against a mirror. Of course. Doing my best to be a motivational speaker at the time. Come on. Preparing myself for the opportunity so that when Mass Mutual called and said, hey, I got 100 sales reps I need you to come encourage. I got you. Love it. Love it. Wow. You just I, I just came up with a a, a few memes, a, a few quotes already for yeah, my next is. content out of that. And one of them is your adversity can become your opportunity. Mm. Mm -hmm. Your adversity be can become your opportunity. So whatever you are dealing with today and you're asking that same question, like, man, when will things change? When will when will I get to this level? Trust me. Trust the process. Trust the process. The preparation is all in the adversity. It is all in the adversity. All those questions, man, I just wish I could. I, I just, yeah, keep working at that because it's going to open up. It's going to break open. And when it does, be ready for that Goliath. Be ready to slay that Goliath. And guess what? You don't got you don't you're not gonna have to pick up somebody else's shield or somebody else's sword or somebody else's armor. It is all what's in your hand, right? So so David used those smooth stones only because that's what he used to slay the wolves that were coming after his sheep. The only reason he killed the bear because of his why. His why was, oh, you know what? I, I can't let them get to my sheep. Uh, I can't let the lion get to my sheep. I, I got to find a way to kill this lion. I got to find a way to kill this bear. So guess what? When your adversity comes, you know why you're doing what you're doing. You got kids. You got a house. You got a wife. You got a husband. You know, you've got a family. You, you've you got a reputation. You, you've just got to put in the work because that is part of your preparation. So your adversity can become your opportunity. Powerful, Absolutely. man. I Absolutely. don't want to see the light at the end of the tunnel. I want to be the light. Oh, man, I'm going to write that thing down. Somebody need to write that in the chat room. I don't want to see the light. I want to be the light. That means that I don't even have to wait till I get to the end of the tunnel because they're going to see my light coming through the tunnel. They, they, they're going to, man, I, I just came up with about five different sermons I'm about to preach Um, yeah, there uh, is. coming up, brother. So, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Listen, I want to thank you, man. This this has been great. We've got to do it again. Absolutely. We've got Please to go. do it again. Absolutely. Shout out to Jeremy Anderson, uh, Speakers Academy. And thank you, Brad, for what you pour into us. I, I just appreciate you every time, your leadership, your um, your knowledge, your wisdom that you continue to share with us at all times. Man, we're, we're looking for more success coming your way. We're looking for more success. Yeah. So everybody, you heard it. Overcome adversity. You can do it. It's very possible. Make it happen. Uh, Brad, also tell people how they can get in touch with you. Oh, man, you can reach me, uh, you know, for booking inquiries, things of that nature. It's www.bradbutler2.com. Uh, email is contact at bradbutler2.com. Uh, Instagram, bradbutler the second. Uh, Facebook, Brad Butler the second. Um, and yeah, I'm pretty easy to, to find. You can you know, shoot me a DM, whatever it is you got going on you need before. I'll be happy to help you. Uh, of course, shout out to uh, the Next Level Speaking uh, Academy. Um, Jeremy Anderson, man, we love you, man. We appreciate all that you do. Um, thank you for, you know, everything that you do for us and, you know, bring us all together. So, you know, we're just going to keep rocking. We're going to keep doing what we're doing to make sure we strengthen the community and we just keep going out and speaking life into the world. That's what we're doing. Yeah, man. And I'm glad I'm not the only one who uses the second, you know. So, you know, when you hear Dr. Phil two, that's where it's coming from. I'm Philip the second. You know, I've I've been using two for everything. You know, even in my rap name, I was clever too. You know, I was, you know, just it, the number two has just been something that has I've rocked with, you know. A lot of people striving for that number one, but number two ain't a bad number. It takes two to make a thing. 
go right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so uh, that's what's up, man. So listen, get in touch with him. Bring him to your event. Uh, invite him as a speaker. Uh, follow him. You see his handle right there. Follow him on Instagram. And uh, listen, man, thank you so much for being a part of this. I can't wait to do it again. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor and a privilege. I, I look forward to the next time. And anybody that's listening, listen, I love you from my bottom of my heart. I encourage every last one of you to make your next day your best day. Thanks. That's what's up. All right, everybody, please share this video. Thank you for those who have shared already. Please share this video. Thank you for watching the rebroadcast of this video. Thank you for being a part of the Anchored Voice, a podcast helping men to anchor life. I'm your host, Dr. Phil Two. Stay anchored. Thank you for listening to The Anchored Voice. For the video edition of this, subscribe to our YouTube channel, McGuire ENTV. For audio, listen on Podbean, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or Stitcher. Until next time, 